Glenn Ashby, who was the pilot, I suppose that is the correct term, or the driver behind this uh, remarkable world record attempt. And now Team New Zealand, I suppose officially, are the holders of the wind-powered land speed record. Quite a mouthful. The wind-powered land speed world record of 222 kilometres an hour. That's the speed that this boat called Horonuku, or yacht, or craft, was clocked 222 kilometres an hour, screaming past the old record of 202 kilometres an hour, set back in 2000 by Britain's uh, Richard Jenkins. The venue, as I said, was in South Australia at Lake Gedna, a 158 kilometre long salt lake and 17 kilometres wide, six and a half hours by a car from Adelaide. So it's literally out back of Australia, out there by no man's land, or in the middle of no man's land. Anyway, Glenn Ashby joins me now. Congratulations, first of all, Glenn. Um, remarkable to think that you are now the world record holder. When you signed on for Team New Zealand all those years ago, could you have conceived that one day you'd be going into the Guinness Book of Records as the world record holder uh, for the wind-powered land speed record? No, look, Brent, it's a, it's a, a wonderful honour and, uh, you know, it's a, a, an absolutely fantastic thing for, for not only Emirates Team New Zealand but also New Zealand as a country, I think, to, you know, uh, be the holder of the, the new wind-powered world land speed record. It's, um, it's, a, it's a really, really difficult record to break and to be able to take that away, uh, you know, from the English is, is pretty nice as well. It's, it's been there for 13 years uh, now being held by uh, England. So it, it's nice to sort of, you know, be the holders. And um, we're all very, very excited and, and, and super pleased. But um, there's definitely more in the tank to come. So we're not sort of we're not quite finished just yet. That question that uh, many adventurers are asked when they do something, whether it was Ed Hillary climbing Mount uh, Everest or someone swimming Cook Strait, why? Why have you done this? Yeah, look, it's been uh, a real childhood dream of mine, uh, Brendan, for a very long time, since I was about seven years old. I've, I've always sort of wondered, um, you know, how fast can you go with a wind-powered craft and after building sort of small land yachts and billy carts with mum's uh, bed sheets and using poles out of dad's shed and making bigger and better ones over the years it's sort of you know you you actually go quite quick when you get pushed along with the breeze or sucked along with the breeze uh, as it is in our case um, you know as you build bigger and more exciting crafts and over the years of obviously sailing and growing up um uh, you know, sailing catamarans and sort of uh, high performance boats, um, you keep pushing the boundaries and you just get going quicker and quicker. And it comes a point in your life where you go, well, how fast can you go? And, and I've just been extremely fortunate to have such a, a great group of people around me at Emirates Team New Zealand that share the same passion of performance and development, um, technology uh, and innovation. And that's really one of the huge strengths of the team. And you know, about six months before the last America's Cup, I actually um, flagged the idea with a few of the designers and engineers and, and my boss, uh, Grant Dalton, about you know the idea of possibly taking it on as a project sort of post uh, hopefully winning the America's Cup, which we which we did. Um, and so we did a feasibility study and managed to organise some external funding, um, bringing that into the team, um, which actually basically green lit the project for us and allowed us to um, retain, you know, our fast you know, fantastic employees and, and boat builders um, and actually bring new people into the team to sort of help take this project on along with the hydrogen uh, chase boat that was built as well. And what it's done is really allowed us to, you know, get out of our comfort zone, if you like, um, push some boundaries which, you know, have never been pushed before and, and sort of think outside the square. And I think taking on these projects is is really special and I think a, a great strength of the team and, again, another feather in the t- in the hat of you know what is one of the world's most successful sporting teams yes i guess a lot of people will be wondering why an america's cup yachting syndicate would deploy what i suspect is a considerable amount of time and money and personnel in a land speed wind land speed record but you're telling me there is a lot of what practical benefits for the development and design aspects of a an america's cup a yachting undertaking that can come from an exercise like this 
Absolutely correct. And the chase boat, um, the hydrogen powered chase boat is another, you know, fantastic example of, of showcasing, you know, technology, engineering and innovation, you know, at, a, at an extremely high level. You know, when you look at sort of the electronic developments, um, you know, of, of, of motor vehicles, for example, you know, over the years, you know, the ABS, the electronic stability controls, all the safety features and things that, that come out of vehicles, for example, all come from Formula One and it's all a trickle down and exactly what we're doing here by pushing you know, aerodynamics and physics to, to levels that sort of haven't been done before and, and the new learnings that you have, you know, really is a special thing and the trickle-down effects go far and wide, um, not only throughout um, the team with the America's Cup, but go wider than that and it really makes you look outside um, the square and bring new information and new technologies um, into what is a very, very competitive game in the America's Cup. So all the teams are looking for anything they can possibly do, um, you know, partnering, partnering with Formula One teams, for example, to try and get an edge over their opponents. And I think what we're doing is, is, is mm. exactly that. We're pushing as hard as we can to have an edge over our opponents with whatever we can do. So tell me about the run itself in Horonuku, the, the name of this craft that to reach this remarkable speed of 222 kilometres. How long did it take in terms of distance from when you put your foot down until when you stopped? Yeah, look, it's a great question. Uh, we used about uh, seven kilometres to uh, actually build up to speed, and it yeah. takes me around about two and a half kilometres to actually slow back down again after I've uh, gone through the the fastest point of uh, the course. So, it's um. It's a pretty wild ride. It's very, very bumpy and noisy. It's definitely built for speed, not for comfort, the craft, but that's exactly what it's designed to do. And um, it's performing absolutely beautifully. And uh, it was very, very uh, comfortable, you know, pushing uh, to the speed we got to. And I think we've, we've certainly got a, a huge amount more in the tank to, to go if we get the right b- breeze conditions and also the right salt conditions. Did you have any anxious moments at all during the run? Uh, there was plenty of anxious moments, but um, it was quite puffy and really, really shifty. So um, I definitely had my work cut out for me way more than I've ever had previously in any of our test runs. It was sort of doing those extra speeds and the fact that we had quite a puffy, shifty day with anything between sort of nine knots and 27 knots of wind. Um, you know, we're doing 200 kilometres an hour uh, across the ground at basically 90 degrees and you're going through puffs and lulls extremely quickly and the wing itself can't re-trim itself instantly and I certainly can't steer the craft instantly and you can't see the wind coming across the water like you can do when you're sailing on on the ocean or the water so you're very much in a sort of uh, reactionary and very slightly anticipatory uh, phase but you can anticipate a lot when you're sailing on the water because you can see what's coming but in the craft um, being so low with the surface just purely white you're literally just you know having to react at at what's coming at you and do the best you possibly can to keep the the craft tracking you know where it needs to go and uh, and not capsizing. So what's the most uh, vulnerable aspect of an exercise like this you just mentioned capsizing and that turbulent wind crosswind and the bumpy nature of the surface capsizing it was is that always a possibility uh absolutely it's uh you only need a, a slight flick of a finger on the uh the, the the controls or 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 your feet to to make a mistake or to get in a slippery piece of salt that you haven't seen to uh to, to potentially get yourself into trouble but you know i've i've done enough test runs now we had um you know some fantastic runs out at the Fanuapai air base with the royal new zealand air force guys and girls out there that kindly let us come out and, and do our testing program there and without that brilliant use of those runways out there to test the craft and actually get comfortable using the um you know the gearbox if you like and, and testing things um you know i could be in a completely different situation now not being able to push the craft hard when we do get the right conditions so doing those test runs getting here and actually getting some runs under our belt at high speeds has been absolutely critical to sort of getting some seat time at you know over 200 kilometers an hour numerous times or or high 190s to really get a feel of what the craft's actually doing and how it's sliding around how the wings trimming how much steering input you need to be putting in um, and actually feeling through the seat of your pants what the craft's actually wanting to do so definitely a lot of learnings but we've kept you know slowly ratcheting up and um, you know I think the, uh, you know, the next time we get out here, we're hoping for a, a lot more wind, and I'm, I'm really hoping I can push the craft to levels that are possibly unthought of. I don't want to sound too ghoulish because uh, you've always struck me as a nice sort of bloke. But um, if it did capsize, <laughs> would you would you be toast? Uh, absolutely not. It's um, it's to be honest, it's one of the most 
safe yachts I've, I've ever been in in my life. It's um, the cockpit is a, a fully designed structural a composite roll cage, basically, which is um, really, really strong. It's built to sort of Formula One standards. I've got a five-point racing harness. I wear a helmet. Um, I'm right down underneath the, the sort of firing line. So pretty much every single piece of the yacht would have to disintegrate before before I'd even get anywhere near getting uh, touched. So compared to sailing uh, moths or ACATs or dinghies or skiffs or even the AC-75 America's Cup boats, um, I think this thing is by far the safest thing I've ever been in my life. Did you have a speedometer in, inside your, your cabin? Uh, did, you, did you know how fast you were travelling? Yeah, look, I, I, I do. I actually have three uh, speed readings. I have uh, one off my uh, Garmin GPS unit that sort of has my track on it, so I know exactly where I am at all times. We've also got a just a digital uh, speedo if my instruments go down for whatever reason and we lose, uh, we lose connection with the battery. Um, I also have a, a, a pitot tube, which is actually an aircraft wind sensor or airspeed sensor as we're using it and that basically tells me exactly what the airspeed is over the craft which then has a calculation to work out how fast you're going over the ground it also gives me my apparent wind angle and speed um, which helps me trim the wing so um, three ways basically of telling how fast we're going and it's amazing how accurate the uh, airspeed sensor actually is it was within basically 0.2 of a kilometre of an hour of what we actually recorded as our record run so when you got to 203 kilometres Kilometers an hour, and you, you're seeing that on one of these instruments in front of you. Uh, you didn't think of just stopping there; that you were still <laughs> accelerating the craft, were you? Hundred percent. Yeah. No, we went through 203, and that was a, a lovely feeling. And you know, when you see the speedo just kept climbing over 210, 215, you know, up to 220, and then eventually tapping out at at 222.43. Uh, look, just a, an amazing feeling, and just a you know, a feeling of relief and a, a huge monkey off your back for not only myself but for the whole team and certainly for the land speed team here at the lake that have put so much effort into uh, preparing the craft and, and basically being with me the whole journey. It's been really wonderful. And I think you mentioned earlier on, just to clarify this, you're not done yet. You want to have another crack at this? Yeah, look, I you know, I'm not personally... Uh, satisfied with the, the you know the end result that we've got uh, as much as it's a fantastic achievement and and, and it is uh, don't get me wrong it's, it's absolutely brilliant but knowing what I feel the craft can do and the low hanging fruit that we can take to uh, to go faster it would be unjust if we didn't go out and really give Hovarinuku a chance to really showcase you know what she can do what do you, what do you think, think that's what do you think really, it might really it might good. get up to Look, my target is uh, has always been 250 kilometres an hour, and uh, I'd love to see that speedo tick over 250 <laughs> kilometres an hour before I uh, we, we pack her up and send her back to New Zealand. That's for sure. And there's no actual straight road. I mean, somewhere you'd think in Australia there must be a straight road of at least 17 k's. You couldn't duplicate or replicate what you've done on salt on a tar sealed road. Look, you could definitely replicate it, but it's uh, unfortunately against the rules to use anything but a natural surface um, for this speed record. So we have to use, um, you know, really Lake Gairdner. It's it's the perfect location for us. It's the only lake big enough really in the world um, to actually give us the, the surface that we're after. It's got very, very good salt um, as it's very natural and it's, um, you know, 160 million years old, uh, the lake itself. So it's a very, very ancient uh, spiritual place out here which is providing us a, a perfect runway and track so all we need basically is the right wind and the salt to be in, in reasonable shape and I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll we'll raise the bar to a place where hopefully in my lifetime and the rest of the team's lifetime uh, we won't have to worry about it getting broken again. Glenn once again congratulations uh, well done. Thank you very much Brendan cheers.